You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is a, a Collected Works volume by Rudolf Steiner, number 279, a cycle of lectures entitled Eurythmy as Visible Speech, translated by Vera and Judy Compton Burnett. This is Lecture 8 of 15 Lectures, entitled The Word as Definition and the Word in its Context. We must in speech eurythmy, as we have already done in tone eurythmy, differentiate between that which tends to carry the word, the tone, down into the physical world, and that which tends to raise it up into the spiritual world. We have until now paid very little attention to this difference. Yesterday, however, at the end of my lecture, I pointed out that when the vowel sound is changed into the diphthong, the sense world does not show itself in such sharply defined outlines, but appears more scattered, more diffused. And this, at the same time, brings us nearer to the spiritual. I pointed out that we easily see one brother, Bruder, when it is the case of one, we have a sharply defined sense impression. Whereas, several brothers, Brüder, make a collective impression. This gathering together of individuals brings us nearer to the world of imagination, of idea. And it is this ascent into the world of idea which is expressed in the diphthong. These diphthong sounds do indeed show themselves to be essentially of a more spiritual nature than the actual vowel sounds of which they are composed. For just as in tone eurythmy, that which is essentially spiritual in the music does not lie in the actual tones, but between the tones, so also in speech eurythmy, that which rays upward to the spiritual does not lie in the sharply emphasized sound, in the sound which is utterly, which is uttered strongly and upon which we rest, but it lies at that point where one sound passes over into the other, thus between the sounds. For this reason, the movements of eurythmy can never become really interesting as long as the eurythmist merely concentrates upon the forming of the separate sounds. But eurythmy can be made deeply interesting when one gradually learns to lead one sound over into the next. Thus we see that this truly spiritual element in eurythmic movement is brought about by the way in which one sound arises out of the other. To this, something further must be added. Fundamentally speaking, every word can be looked at from two aspects. On the one hand, we have the aspect of external imitation. On the other hand, the placing of that, which is thus expressed, into the whole world order. If today people were more disposed to study language from a spiritual point of view, realizing the way in which each language arises from out of its own genius, great stress would be laid upon the interesting fact that in the configuration of a word, it is not merely the individual significance of a process or thing that is described, but its relationship to a collective whole. All these things must be taken into account. Thus, we must realize that in declaiming a poem or merely endeavoring to give a word its true proportion in a sentence, the reciter must instinctively, by means of his artistic feeling, develop this attitude toward the sounds of speech. Such or such is the relationship of a word to its whole context. I shall speak about these things in detail later. Now, however, I am trying to show how, on the one hand, words have the descriptive element, and how, on the other hand, there is the possibility of going beyond the word itself and entering into the poem or sentence as a whole. We can see this best by taking definite examples. Let us first take a very characteristic type of word, the personal pronoun. Such words, in their very nature, place that to which they refer into some quite definite relationship, or, which is indeed much the same thing, they remove it right out of this relationship. We will take as an example the word ich, 
I and ask someone to express it in your rhythm, standing still. Parenthesis, Fräulein W., will you do this? Parenthesis. Now in these movements for E and Ch, you have expressed the word Ich. But to an unprejudiced observer, there will be something lacking in these movements. In themselves, they are quite correct, and certainly do express the word Ich in visible language. And yet there is something lacking. One has the feeling that here the ich is simply represented diagrammatically. It is as if the only impression we had of a man were his portrait. Such a representation of the ich is not sufficiently living, for the spirit of man which lies behind the manifestation of the ich is not fully expressed. What then is the spiritual essence of the word ich? In this word, there lies the pointing back to oneself, the concept of the self, but the concept of the self turned inward toward the self. And if one wishes to express this backward turning into the self, it can be done excellently, not by standing still, but by moving. Let us suppose, therefore, that you take two steps forward and then two steps backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. Thus you will retrace your steps, going back over the same line and returning to your starting point. With the two forward steps do the E sound and with the two backward steps the SH. In this way, movement enters into the expression of the word ICH, movement which finds its way back again into itself, just as the ICH conception contains the feeling of turning back into the self. If you carry out the movements in this way, taking two steps forward with the E and two steps backward with the CH, you will enter right into the form, see the diagram, and this form is of such a nature that it grow, grows directly out of the meaning inherent in this combination of sounds. Let us pass over from the ich, I, to the du, thou. Here we have quite another feeling. The whole relationship is different, indicating a connection with some other being. Parenthesis, Fräulein S., will you make the movements for DU, standing still as before, DU, close parenthesis. But in this simple expression of the DU, there is again a certain feeling of dissatisfaction, for here again we only have the picture of the DU, not the actual DU itself. The movement is not living. The real spirit of the word is lacking. We must seek some means which will help us to find our way to this spirit. In the case of the word ich, it is quite clear that one turns back into oneself. With the word du, when one really enters into the nature of the du, thus coming into contact with somebody, not oneself, the other, then one goes out of oneself. Here one cannot go back on the same line and touch the starting point again, for this would lead one back into oneself. That is obviously impossible. On the other hand, one cannot go altogether out of oneself, for then one would not be expressing the word du, but the word er or sie, he or she. You will e easily feel this. Thus with du it is necessary to give some slight indication of one's own being also. This can only be done when the line of the form turns back, touching itself at some definite point. And there's a diagram. This diagram shows the point at which you cross your previous line. When, therefore, instead of simply going backward and forward, you only touch the line of the form once on your way back, you have the complete movement for do. The d should be made during the first part of the form and the U on the way back. But the line must only cross itself at the one point. Now, you have really brought the DU into movement and have done so in such a way that it has not become an ER or a Z. You have retained a certain contact with yourself, even if this contact is but slight. It is, however, possible to strengthen the feeling of oneself. If we wish to do this, if we wish the going out from ourselves to become weaker and weaker, then while making the oo 
the form can be carried out in this way. And there's a diagram where it shows you crossing the line, so to speak, twice. This do would, however, in no way express a loving feeling. If you try the form for yourself, you will notice that the effect is somewhat pinched, much less outgoing in character. Such things as these can, of course, only be realized through the feelings. They are, however, not difficult to feel. I have already indicated the way in which the air can be shown. The impression of air is given by never allowing the second part of the form to touch the line taken by the first part of the form. Readers aside, I'm pronouncing the word er, er, he, end of readers aside. Thus we find that the er form is the circle, where we have a line which is never touched again until the starting point is reached. The air must be expressed by a circular form, by a line which never turns back onto itself. Here we have another possibility. You do not come back to your starting point, and were you to do so, the form would already be completed. Thus we have a line which never crosses itself at any point, and which expresses for us the word air. Parenthesis Fräulein S. Will you come and make the movements for air standing still? Close parenthesis. It is impossible to give the real feeling for air while standing still. One cannot even produce a pictorial impression. All that we have is the egotistical contemplation of the other person or thing. There is no going out of oneself. Now add this form to the movements. Simply make a circle so that you come back to the point from which you started. Accompany one side of the form with the A and the other side with the R, and you will see how well the feeling of the air is expressed. Some time ago I gave an exercise built up upon a special combination of sounds. It began with the word der, the, which is indeed similar in character to er, and it was built up on the er feeling, and carried out in such a way that the form never had, never at any point came back and touched the previous line. Parenthesis, Fräulein S.C.H., will you show us this exercise? Der Folken durchleuchte. Try and do it in such a way that you bring it into all that I have said. Close parenthesis. Der Volk ent... Say that again. Der Volken durchleuchte. Er durchleuchte. Er durchsonne. Er durchglühe. Er durchwärme. Auch mich. He who illuminates the clouds. May he illuminate. May he irradiate. May he inspire and fill with warmth and light even me. Close parenthesis. She has now done this, er, close quote, she has done, now done this in such a way that the character of er, he, upon which the entire poem is built, was shown in the exercise as a whole. She has done it in such a way that the air was carried in movement through the whole poem. There is, however, another way of doing the exercise. Every time the word er, he, occurs, make a, make a circle, but also carry out the form of a circle in the course of the whole poem. Thus, whenever the word er appears, make a circle, go a little further, make another circle, and so on. By this means, the whole thing takes on a quite different character, quite another type of movement. There's a diagram. In the old way of doing this exercise, we felt that we must devote ourselves more to the mood of the poem as a whole. In the new way, we give ourselves up to the changing moods, to the illuminating, the irradiating, the inspiring with warmth and light. Passing over from the ich to the wir, we, that is to say from the singular to the plural, for we implies at least two people, we are no longer dealing with a solo dance, but have come into the realm of the round dance. If there are two people taking part in the form, it can be done in the following way, and there's a diagram. The working together, the losing of the self, is expressed by means of the circle. The ich is expressed by each individual, taking a number of steps forward, and at the same time saying aloud the word wir, or we, and then going back over the same line, forward, backward, forward, backward. 
In this way, the two aspects of the word are shown quite clearly. Thus, if only two people are taking part, they stand opposite to one another, approach each other, draw back again, approach each other, draw back again, and in so doing express the inner feeling of the word, vir. If four people take part, the circle becomes more complete, and by moving backward and forward over the same line, the vir is very well expressed. The feeling of belonging together can be strengthened by taking hands, but this will hardly be possible with two people only. Here we have a very beautiful expression of vir. Let four eurythmists stand in a circle saying the word vir, or we, aloud, in the way I have already explained. Begin by joining hands. Now take two steps forward with the W, passing over into the I or E when you have reached the center. Complete the backward journey with R and again join hands. Care must be taken not to make the E too soon. In this way we really express the word vir. Quite beautiful shades of feeling can be brought into such an exercise. One must, however, always experience the difference between ich, wir, and so on. There is still another exercise which can be very beautiful. If four eurythmists stand as indicated in the diagram, not taking hands this time, but making the movements backward, what will this express? Ihr, you. We have du, thou, carried over into the plural. There can be no doubt about it. It is quite apparent. In this exercise, we show the turning away from ourselves, the feeling of ihr. The word ihr must also be spoken aloud. And from the very beginning, the arms must tend in a backward direction. In this way, much that is of significance can be brought into the exercise. These things should also be taken into account when studying the structure of a poem, for they are exceedingly characteristic. All that can be felt and experienced in the single words, particularly in such characteristic words as the personal pronouns, must be sought for and experienced in the structure of language as a whole. Very much more could be said on this subject, but for the moment we will pass on to another exercise. Let us ask three eurythmists to form themselves in a triangle and then carry out this form. Here you have Z, they, the plural of er. If you wish to give characteristic expression to the word Z, you will do so most easily when you all three move the forms in the same direction, all toward the same side. Parenthesis, you must all start from the same point and reach the same point at the end of the form. Close parenthesis. Thus, Z, Z, Z. Here we have the direct expression for the word Z. Now, the question naturally arises, how can I apply these things? For in the ordinary way, it will certainly not be possible to carry out such a form in the case of each separate word. Although of this you may be quite certain, something very beautiful would grow out of the dexterity and skill which would be achieved by the diligent practice of all I have indicated for such single words as du, er, wir, ihr, sie, it would lead to something very beautiful. In the case of certain poems, we have quite definitely the ich or I character. In other poems, especially in love poems, we have the du or thou character. And in the case of quite a number of poems, here I am reminded particularly of nearly all the poems of Martin Greif, we have a most pronounced er or he character. One can enter right into the whole mood of a poem when one is able to perceive in a poem itself the I, thou, or he character, and then express the poem by means of a form which has been drawn from out of the very nature of the I, thou, he, we, you, or they. A specially beautiful effect may be attained when the objective mood, the mood of he, the mood of going out of oneself is carried over into what is more subjective in its feeling. Let us take an example. Let, let us take as an example that poem from which we have learned so much already, for from whichever point of view we look at it, it seems as if specially written for the study of Eurythmy. I refer to Goethe's famous poem, 
so well known to us all. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruhe, in allen Wipfeln spürest du kaum einen Hauch. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde, warte nur, balde ruhest du auch. English, o'er all the hilltops is quiet now, in all the treetops hearest thou hardly a breath. The birds are asleep in the trees. Wait, soon, like these, thou, to, thou too shalt rest. Close parenthesis. Close quote. Let us analyze this poem quite objectively. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruh. He will give this the he character. In allen Wipfeln spürest du kaum einen Hauch. Here we pass on to the thou. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde, er or he, warte nur, balde ruhest du auch. Now we must ask, should this be the I or the thou character? For Goethe is here speaking to himself. You could try it both ways. Let us first try it in this way. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruh, er, he. In allen Wipfeln spürest du kaum einen Hauch. Du, thou. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde. Er, he. Warte nur, balde ruhest du auch. Du, thou. If we do so, we shall see how the form arises out of the whole mood of the poem. Personal pronouns such as ich, du, and so on are, when uttered, in reality nothing else than a crystallization a condensation of a mood or feeling otherwise spread over a whole passage. In this particular poem, the first lines are permeated by the he mood, the next lines by the thou, then comes the he once more, then again the thou, or as we shall presently see the I, which is in the mood of the last lines. Warte nur, balde ruhest du auch. Now, Let us do the whole poem in the second way. He, thou, he, I. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruh, in allen Wipfeln, er, he. Spürest du kaum einen Hauch, du, thou. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde, er, he. Warte nur, balde ruhest du auch, ich, I. Now, by giving the form the I character, you have seen how entirely different it becomes. If we try both forms, one after the other, we shall certainly decide that the second is the better. This will undoubtedly prove to be the right way. From such a poem you can gain the most wonderful perception of how the form develops right out of the poem itself. You must learn to feel the relationship existing between a certain combination of sounds and the meaning of the word thus formed a personal pronoun, for example. Consider for a moment how beautifully some such short poem as the following can be worked out, if we study its meaning and make use of all that we now know. Quote, Schlummer und Schlaf, zwei Brüder, zum Dienste der Götter berufen, bat sieg Prometheus herab, seinem Geschlechte zum Trost, aber den Göttern so leicht doch schwer zu ertragen den Menschen. Wart nun, ihr Schlummer uns schlaf, wart nun, ihr schlaf uns zum Tod. Close quote. Here, the words, here the word uns, us, occurs twice. We will, of course, treat it in the same way as wir, we, and make use of the wir form. If we now look more closely into the poem, we shall be able to analyze it as follows. Schlummer und Schlaf, zwei Brüder, zum Dienste der Götter berufen. Obviously an air form. Bat sieg Prometheus herab, seinem Geschlechte zum Trost. Now, in the word bitten, to ask, there is necessarily a turning toward some other person. There is an indication of the do. We feel the underlying character of do. Aber den Göttern so leicht, doch schwer zu ertragen den Menschen. With these words we pass over to something which leads us into the depths of our own being. 
Such knowledge can only be attained by entering into the very nature of the thing in question. Here, therefore, an opportunity presents itself of making use of the position I have already shown you, the position for knowledge. Wart nun ihr Schlummer uns schlaf. The light sleep of the gods becomes deep sleep for man, and the deep sleep of the gods becomes death for man. Wart nun ihr schlaf uns zum Tod. Here we come into the region of destiny, common to all men by reason of their humanity. We have the Wir. We shall be able to make a form which really brings life into the poem if we make use, in the first place, of those forms which we have gained from a study of the personal pronouns, and in the second place, where the whole thing is brought into the realm of the spiritual, of the movement, the position for knowledge. We shall get good results if we regard these forms as really fundamental forms and make use of them quite freely, but with due regard to the sense and correctness of the way in which they are applied. Fräulein S., will you do the first line to an air form, fitting in the whole line to the one form? With the second line, make a do form. With the third, or rather in the pause between the second and third lines, and again at the end of the third line, take up the position for knowledge, finally using the wir form for the last line. You will, however, not be able to make the wir form alone. Two other eurythmists must therefore make their appearance on the stage, one coming from the left wing, the other from the right. By this means the last line will be colored with the feeling of wir, of we. This example shows you how such forms may be worked out. They are developed from out of the poems themselves. From all that has been said and from these simple examples, I hope you are beginning to understand the spirit in which the study of eurythmy has to be undertaken. With eurythmy, one has really to study the poem. It is not enough merely to learn the sounds. But one must enter right into its whole content, into all the nuances of feeling and fine shades of mood contained within it. And no one should attempt to express a poem in eurythmy who has not first put to himself the question, what is the fundamental character of this poem? Upon what artistic foundation is it based? Let us take another example from Goethe. Seit, o Geister des Heins, o seit die Nymphen des Flusses, eure entfernten Gedenk, euer Nahen zur Lust. Weihend verehrten sie im Stillen die ländlichen Feste, wir dem gebannten Pfad folgend beschleichen das Glück. Amor wohne mit uns, es macht der himmlische Knabe, gegenwärtige Lieb und die Entfernten euch nah. Now as a preliminary study, we must begin carefully to examine the poem. These things which I am necessarily treating in a somewhat sketchy way at the moment must be gone into thoroughly and in detail when one is working out a poem with a view to doing it in eurythmy. So we have Zeit, O Geister des Heins, O Zeit, ihr Nymphen des Flusses. What is this but the do form, a form of address? If you are working out the poem with several eurythmists, as we mean to do now, you will, of course, begin with the ear form. Eure entfernten Gedenk, euren Nahen zur Lust. Once more, ihr. Weihend feierten sie im Stillen die ländlichen Fest. Sie, wir dem gebannten Pfad folgend, beschleichen das Glück. Wir, Amor wohne mit uns, es macht der himmlische Knabe. Er, gegenwärtige Lieb und die entfernten euch nah. Ihr. In the second line we repeat the ear form in order to express euch, your. The example consists of six lines. I will now ask three eurythmists to group themselves together and express the whole poem in the way I have indicated. Before beginning you must be quite clear about what it is you have to do. You must make the form according to the rules given. 
In this case, therefore, ihr, ihr, sie, wir, er, ihr, each form to spread out over a whole line. There are, of course, other ways of doing it. Two of the rhythmists can remain standing, and the third do the er form alone. Then we should have Amor wohne mit uns, es macht der himmlische Knabe, done as a solo line, after which all three would join together in the ihr form gegen vertige lieb und die entfernten euch na. In this way, we learn to realize the possibility of studying a poem by means of the eurythmic forms. The end of lecture eight.